so today is the second lecture now on uh, query optimization Im implementation. So the quick announcement I'll have to say is that uh, immediately after this, uh, this, this today's lecture, we go up to the eighth floor. We have the co-founder of Stream, which is the stream processing platform. Uh, is come flew in from uh, California to come give a talk here at CMU. So if you have time, please come check it out. And like I said, in my uh, message on Piazza, he's still looking for several interns. So you can talk to him about that if you're if you're interested. Okay. All right. So today's agenda, we're going to focus more on cascades. Um, and I realized I had you guys read the MemSQL paper on their optimizer, which it's an okay paper. Uh, it, but it's not a cascade implementation. And the reason why I had you guys read that is I'm still looking for what's the right paper for you guys to, you know, to read in this class for the second lecture on optimization. Uh, and in, in my opinion, it is interesting because they sort of describe the same techniques that we're talking about here, just in different, different terms. Um, and there's a whole bunch of extra stuff they talk about to how to do distributed query optimization, which I think is correct, but it's not germane to what we're doing here, so that's fine. But we're going to spend most of our time talking on, on cascades, and in particular, uh, how I'm going to describe cascades is essentially how it's described in the Columbia paper, the Columbia uh, work. Um, and then we'll talk about Orca, which is a uh, implementation, a modern implementation of, of cascades. And then we'll finish up talking about the extra credit assignment, which will, will go out today. Okay? So, as a refresher for where we were at from the last, last class, uh, we spent time walking through the sort of the history of query optimization, and we discussed the various ways you can implement a query optimizer. Going back from the very beginning in the 1970s uh, with Ingress and, and Oracle, you had a heuristic-based approach where you basically, in your source code of your system, you have some hard-coded rules that do various trans transformations and optimizations to try to put the query plan into a optimized form. And as we said, that this was sort of a hacky way to do this because uh, it's not considering cost in any, any of its calculations. So it just knows that I have some hard and fast rules that like are static rules that I always want to you know, do predicate push down, or I always want to do uh, you know, put the largest table as the outer table in, in a join. And then we talked about how to do something more sophisticated to do what's done in uh, was done in IBM System R and the early version of DB2 where now you do the same heuristics to do some static transformations that the first systems did, but then you also include now this additional step where you have a cost-based uh, search model to look for uh, you know, an optimal query plan, and, and you're using your cost model to estimate you know, whether one plan is better than another. And in the original example of System R, and what most people do, what most people care about is trying to figure out what the proper join ordering is. Uh, for complex queries, right? For two tables, it's pretty easy, but when you start going beyond that, it's it's MP hard or MP complete. So they needed to come up with a way to to to, to make this easier to, uh, to do. Then, then we talked about the randomized search algorithms. So this was the simulated annealing approach or the genetic genetic uh, algorithm uh, approach in Postgres. And as I said. Only Postgres is the only one that knows that actually does this. And they only kick in the genetic algorithm when your query has 13 or more tables. Right? But then we spend most of our time talking about, at the end, the, the, the stratified search and the unified search. Right? And these are, these are ways to build what are called optimizer generators, uh, where you can define in a declarative language the rules for the transformations that you want to apply on a query. And then you have a rules engine, apply those transformations, and it does some kind of search to find the, uh, uh, an optimal plan. So the Starburst approach was the first one out of IBM uh, that did this stratified search, where you sort of have two stages. And then now it's in use in DB2, and as far as I can tell, it's used in Oracle. And then the unified search model is, is the Volcano or Cascades, Cascades approach, um, which is now used in SQL Server, Greenplum, Calcite, our system, and a bunch of other stuff. Okay, so again, we'll spend most of our time talking about this, but it's, it's, it's important to see how these two things are, uh, can be distinguished from each other. I should have spent a little bit of time last class talking about how what Postgres does in a bit more detail. So as I said, there's a genetic algorithm that, that, that is only fired or, or enabled when your query has 13 or more tables. But in general, uh, they fall back to the heuristic plus cost model search. Um, 
And what's really interesting about this, what, what they do is it's, it's a good example of why, in my opinion, a Cascades model or unified search model is better because from a software engineering standpoint, it makes it easier to maintain and extend the, the query optimizer. So in the case of Postgres, they have what I'll call a rigid workflow in the query optimi optimizer where you go through these different stages. And these different stages have different responsibilities and they make assumptions about what the query plan from one stage is producing is, is going to be fed into it. Right? So in the first stage, they, they basically do what we said before in Ingress and in the first versions of Oracle, where you have these static rules to do rewriting or transformations based on heuristics. Um, I, I, again, predicate pushdown is, is, the, is the classic one. So then you, have, you, then you go into a cost-based search model. It's basically the same thing they did in System R, where you're trying to find the optimal join ordering. So then at this point, you have, uh, you have a basic physical plan, uh, but it may be actually missing some extra stuff that you need in your, that you need in your query. Things like aggregations or having clauses. So what will happen is after you do the cost-based search, then they go into this next stage and then they add in back all the stuff that your query needs. So they sort of strip it all out, run the cost-based search to find the, the, the right join ordering, and then they go add everything in to actually complete the physical plan. Right? And then if you have, if you have sub-queries, you basically do this recursively. So you go into the, to the inner query, uh, do all the planning you need there, uh, maybe you try to do some join, uh, do some rewriting to, to, to elevate the sub-query out. Um, but essentially, you're just doing all these stages for each of them. So the, one of the lead developers of Postgres is, lives in Pittsburgh. He's actually a CMU alum. He got his PhD here in the 1990s, not in databases, um, in software engineering, I think. Um, and so we had lunch with him a few years ago when we were trying to get started on the Peloton project because we started with Postgres because we thought, well, let's take the query optimizer and the, the SQL parser and we can use that in our system. And so we would ask him basic questions about, you know, how does this work? How does that work? And, you know, to get a, get a sense of how easy it would be for us to, to modify this. And he kind of shook his head and said, like, this is, this is one of the, the most tricky parts of Postgres um, that's actually kind of brittle because all these stages have, again, have these assumptions about what the plans need to look like. Uh, and he admitted that not very many people actually understand the Postgres uh, query optimizer. And so, it's, again, it's amazing what they've done with it. Uh, and, you know, the, the things they're able to support. Um, but we decided to end up ditching this entirely and go build our own because we didn't want to have to have, you know, spend a shitload of time trying to figure out what this thing was actually doing. So this is a good example of sort of how things were before optimizer generators, right? This is an example where inside of the database system is, is it's, it's the, 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 the programmer actually writes the transformations or writes the codes that can, then gets executed uh, as it's written to make changes and try to optimize the system. So the opt optimizer generated movement that came out of the, the late 1980s, early 1990s was this idea that rather than having to have all this bake in exactly uh, your transformations in code through these uh, static uh, transformations, instead that you could again write your rules in a declarative language, which in theory would be easier for people to, to extend and maintain, depending on what language is written in, that's, that may, may, or, may or may not be true. And then the idea was that you write your declarative rules, then you run it through this rules engine, which then generates the C or C++ code that you then compile and link into your system. And then now any single time you need, you need to modify or extend your, your query optimizer, you go modify the declarative rules. And then the rules engine can make sure that everything is correct. So the advantage of this approach is that you're going to be able to separate how you're actually going to perform the search over the query plan to find the, the best choice for you from the actual data model. So this means that whether you're writing on a document database, like a JSON database like Mongo, whether it's a relational database, a graph database, you could still use the same optimizer generator, and you could still apply the same transformations you need to optimize your query without having it to be specific to one particular data model. Um, and likewise, you can then write all these transformation rules uh, for logical operators and physical operators to be completely separate from each other without trying to worry about how they're inter intermingled. Yes? Uh, why not? Because it sounds to me like if you have, if your optimizer is still doing the trans transformation from logical plan to physical plan, it needs to, be, it needs to know something about the, 
the physical makeup of the bidding. So his, his statement is, um, if you need to do a transformation from a logical plan to a physical plan, uh, wouldn't your transformations need to know something about the database? Yeah, the data model. The data model. So think a layer above that. Like it's not, you know, the transformations are like, you know, not like read this bit at this offset, right? It's the standard things like predicate pushdown. Predicate pushdown is makes sense whether it's a, a document database or a relational database, right? Uh, so, so you're not hard coding it to, to any you know any one query language or any one data model. You don't need to know these things. All that logic about like you know maybe the physical layout of the data. You may, there may be one uh, algorithm, physical operator you may want to use versus another. That ends up being put into the cost model, which we'll talk about next time. I guess I'm really asking them what would a DSL like that look like? Relational calculus. Okay. <laughs> which is not, not pretty. Uh, no, and I'll, I mean, so in our case, it's C, right? Um, for these, again, so think of these as, as like toolkits. So rather than essentially what we're doing now, we, we implement our own Cascades implementation, right? The idea was that you could take these toolkits, download them, and write your, your uh, you know, the, the rules, and then it would spit out code that you could link in, right? And the rule is going to be something like predicate push down to define it somewhere. Yeah, like, like something that looks like data log sort of, or like it's uh, in, the, in the case of uh, Starburst, it's this thing, uh, SGML or something. it's some 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 high level language that you that you can de define these transformations. For our purposes, we don't care, right? So, all right. Um, and again, another big thing is that the 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 implementation of how you're actually going to perform the search, uh, whether it's top down or bottom up, can be independent of how you define all these things, right? That's left to the rules engine that's going to apply these changes and do the search. So as I said, Starburst is the first example. And then the Gertz Graffy, who invented the Cascade stuff, he had basically three, three iterations of this. And he, at every single step, he learned from mistakes and made one better than the other. And the last one he did was, was Cascades. And then Opt++ was a uh, optimizer generated toolkit out of Wisconsin for the Paradise Project. We'll talk about a little bit about this in a second. But the basic idea of this one was they actually try to go do everything. So they, they, they wanted to do top down, they wanted to do bottom up, they support all of them and try to figure out, you know, which one would actually be the best. So this is the, for these papers here, they actually did the, the, the most comprehensive bake off of the different models to see which, which one actually works. But it was back in the, the 90s. Um, so it's somewhat, somewhat dated. All right, so in the, again, the, the two different, two major uh, approaches that, that we care about are the stratified search and then the unified search. And again, the, the stratified search is where we have, uh, we write our transformation rules to put us from, uh, to do logical changes to our query plan. Um, and then when we do these changes though, we don't actually never consider the cost model because it's sort of like this, the static rules that we had in the heuristic based approach, but they're just defined in a nice DSL to make these things easier to maintain. Um, but we don't look at the cost model for anything. And then uh, we do a cost-based search. Again, whether it's bottom up or top down, uh, it depends on what you actually want in, in your implementation. But this is where you actually then do a, a conversion from the logical plan to the physical plan. Um, and we use a cost model to decide whether we have one is better than another. In the unified search, we don't make a distinction between different stages of doing logical to logical transformations or logical to physical trans transformations. It's all in one single search model, right? Um, and at all, every single step, we can consult the cost model to help us make decisions about whether we're doing the right thing. Now, for some logical to logical transformations, you actually can't get a cost until you actually get a physical operator. Um, but for other cases, you can take an upper bound and you know, an estimate of what you think you're think, uh, what your operator is going to do and use that to help guide the search process a little bit better. So the major downside of the unified search model is that you end up doing a way more transformations throughout the entire search. Because as we'll see in, in our examples, you know, we can do swaps, you know, to put, you know, for doing A join B, we could swap that to be B join A, and then another logical transformation could put, put us back to A join B. So to avoid these redundant computations and end up 
you know, avoid getting caught in, in an infinite loop, we're going to take advantage of memoization to reduce the amount of redundant work we're essentially doing, right? To reduce the number of uh, redundant or unnecessary transformations or things that we've already done, and also avoid having to go to the cost model and, and do an estimate um, because we already know we we already know we've computed the cost for a particular change. So one thing to be, to be uh, important to note is that there is actually the unified model and the stratified model are separate, but these are mutually exclusive to whether you want to do a top-down or a bottom-up uh, search model, search approach. Right? In the case of op++, uh, it could be a unified model, and, and, and actually it was, it was always a unified model, but it could either do uh, one or the other. It just so happened that like the first stratified search model implementation well, of Starburst was a, was a bottom-up approach, and Volcano and Cascades are the most well-known unified models, and these are, are top-down. Uh, but they, they, they could be completely separate. You could have one versus the other in either approach. So the big thing to understand about top-down optimization is that we're going to start with the final outcome of what we want for our query plan. And then we're going to work down in the tree and do transformations to either go from logical to logical or logical to physical and generate a query plan uh, working to the bottom where we get to the final access methods. Contrast this with bottom up is where essentially you start with nothing. You start with the access methods and then you build up your, your query plan uh, by adding in the pieces that, that you need. Right? And at a high level, these are essentially the same. Uh, the op plus plus paper shows that you can generate you know, roughly the, the, the equivalent query plans in either one. Um, I think it really comes down to, in many ways, the, uh, the from a software engineering and maintainability, where I, I actually think that, for me, this is sort of easier the reason that, that it's about. But we'll see a comment at the end where um, the, uh, the, the creator of Cascades actually says that this actually might be better than Cascades. Because he made a side comment last year, which I haven't really thought through yet. OK, so the Cascades uh, Query optimizer, as I said, is an object-oriented implementation of uh, of the uh, the volcano query optimizer that, that he built. So there is an original Cascades paper from 1995. I didn't have you guys read it because I actually don't think it's very good. And the Columbia master's thesis that I had you guys read, those 30 pages are, in my opinion, actually the best explanation of <laughs> what Cascades actually is. So. Columbia is not an exact implementation of Cascades, but it, there are some optimizations that they do. But for our purposes, we'll just, when I say Cascades here, um, you know, in some ways I really mean Columbia, but they're at a high level, they're essentially the same. So the key thing about Cascades is they claim that they're object-oriented. Um, this was in the 90s, this was in Vogue, so they make a big deal about this. Um, but then they're gonna allow us to do simplistic rewriting for expressions uh, by using a mapping function to do these transformations rather than doing have to do an exhaustive search. Right? And another big thing is that they'll be able to uh, do transformations on the fly rather than having to pre-generate them all at once. So on Volcano, as you do the top-down search, every single time you landed at a group, uh, you would apply all the transformations immediately and explode your search base. Whereas in Cascades, as we'll see in a second, you only do transformations as you need. All right, so the, the four major things that, that are, are unique about Cascades is that the optimization tasks are just data structures that get loaded into a queue, and we can apply them uh, one by one. Um, we can embed in our group's uh, physical properties or requirements that we need to have about our data, like whether things need to be sorted a certain way. Um, and then our rules can consider them and know that they can apply certain transformations if those transformations would violate these rules. All right, so contrast this again with what we saw in system R where I said the search model had no way to know that data needed to be sorted a different way. You had to embed that logic inside of the, the cost model. All right, so now you have this weird thing where the logic about whether something is a good, uh, is going to be sorted correctly the way you need it would be embedded in the cost model and not the actual search itself. Then they're also going to have support for ordering of moves by promise. And this essentially means that you can define priorities for your, your transformations and reshuffle things as, 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 you, as you go down into the search tree. And then predicates them will be treated as logical and physical operators, which then allows us to write transformations that do predicate pushdown and all the other things that we, that we do want to do. 
just as if we were doing changes on, on operators in our query plan. So I'm going to go through a bunch of the definitions that Cascades talks about um, for expressions and, and groups and multi-expressions, and then we'll do an example to see at a high level how, the, how Cascades actually works. So the first thing is that they're going to define uh, expressions. And expressions aren't going to be like a predicate. Uh, I sometimes may, may use that term, like a you know, where clause expression. Um, but it really has to do with a, a sort of high-level operator that we have in our, in our, in our system. Right? So it could be not any operator with a, a one or more, uh, zero or more input expressions. So a logical expression could be uh, A join B join C. Um, and then the physical expression that is equivalent to this logical expression could be uh, do a file scan so that the subscript F means file scan, su subscript uh, HJ means hash join. So do a file scan on AF and hash join it with, with a file scan on B, and then do a nested loop join uh, on C uh, retrieved by file scan. So again, these are logically equivalent, even though one is a uh, physical operator, one's a logical operator, meaning they're both going to output the exact same result. And because we know this, it allows us to do, you know, determine and optimize certain things later on. So what we can do now is we can now define uh, what are called groups, which would be a set of logic equivalent physical and logical operations that all produce the same output. So in my previous example, the logical expression was logically equivalent to the physical expression because they both produced the output of A join B join C. And so what will happen is all the, in, in a single group, we'll sort of define them based on what their output is. So again, in this case here, I'm defining the output of this group as the uh, A join B join C. And I don't define in this case at this high level output requirement, I'm not defining the order of anything. Right? This, this, is, this is a logical output. So I'm going to have all my logical expressions which is, again, just the all possible permutations of join orderings to produce this output. And then the physical expressions will be all possible uh, physical implementations of every single possible logical implementation uh, that produce the same output. And I can define how I'm accessing the data how, and how I'm doing the join. Right? If I had things like I needed to know that this was sorted, I could, I could, could have requirements and properties to say that this, thing, this output has to be sorted. And that all could be encapsulated in the, the physical expressions here. Right? So the first thing to see is that for a simple thing, you know, A join B join C, I'm going to have a ton of different logical expressions. And each, for the, each individual logical expression, I'm going to have a ton of different uh, physical expressions that are equivalent to them. So I need to do something about reducing my search space for all these equivalent expressions and also reducing the storage space for all these because now I need to keep track of all these different different uh, expressions, and I may have to you know jump to them in the search tree, compute a cost on them, and store information about them. So in order to cut down on all the storage overhead, they're going to organize uh, groups in terms of what are called multi-expressions. And the idea here is that instead of having explicit instantiations of every single uh, logical operator and physical operator, uh, I can instead define them in terms of these multi-expressions that, are, again, are logically equivalent to what, what I showed in the previous slide. So again, my output is A join B join C. So in this case here, I could have uh, a uh, multi-expression that says A join B join C and A, B, A and B are grouped together, and same for B and C and, and so forth going down here. And then on the physical side, I only need to now define what the actual join algorithms I want to use. So previously, I was saying, here's how, here's how I'm going to scan it, and here's how I'm joining A and B, and here's how I'm joining C. But in my multi-expression, I can say, I'm going to join A and B. I don't know how. You'll figure this out later. But just represent A and B uh, in, in this multi-expression as, as this, as a sort of a high-level concept. But then to join it with C, again, not defining how we actually access it, I, I'll say that here's my join algorithm. Right? And then the idea is as you're now going to do the search, you would know to say, all right, well, I, I need to know how to convert this into a physical operator. So you'll jump to a group that has this multi-expression that's, that's equivalent to it, and then do planning on this. It'll, it'll become more clear in, in, the, in the example. 
Question? No. Yes. So how do you decide which group or uh, which uh, attributes you're going to express as a single multi expression and like that's it? So if there are like A, B, C, D, in which you can have both A, B, and C, D. You could have A, B as one multi expression and C, D as one multi expression. You could have A and B, C, D as the. You have all of them. Yeah. You have to have all. Okay. Right. So. In here, assume like I, so the dot 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 means it, it keeps going for all possible combinations, right? And as we see in the example, the you can define a priority on these transformations so that you can maybe only transform the first one, and and because you think that's going to be the one that's going to probably do the most benefit. Or even if you have an enforcer rule, you say, well, this thing produces my output in the sort of order that I need, so all these other ones I, I won't instantiate. Well, we'll see an example of how you sort of go through one by one, apply the transformation, and then figure out what the cost is, right? But you have to have everything. All right, I'm just showing only a subset. So this is a good example, actually, what a distinction between the, 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 the top down and the bottom up stuff. So in the case of, of bottom up, you would start with the the to individual elements or the individual tables you want to access. So you would, you would first do your planning on how to access A, then you do your planning on how to access B and how to access C. And then in the in the next level up as you go as you go across or going up in the search stream, uh, then you consider how to join A and B, how to join B and C, how to join C and A, right? And then after that you go up to the next level and how to figure out how to the right way to join A, B, and C all together, right? So, in the case of uh, if in, in the top-down model, you can actually take advantage of the fact that you know something about how you, how you need to join A, B, and C, and you can use this information to, to make decisions about whether you go down, you know, looking at A, C first, or B, C first, or A, C first, right? Because you know all of this ahead of time. Again, I think when I show the example, this will be more clear. All right, so now we can define what are rules to do these extra transformations. And essentially, there's two classes of rules, right? There's the logical to logical, logical to physical. So under Cascade's terminology, uh, a transformation rule is to go from a logical to log logical operator to a logical operator, and an implementation rule is going from a logical to physical. And the way they're going to represent this in the uh, optimizer is that every rule is defined by the pattern that it gets that is triggered or that you look for to say that you should apply this rule, uh, you know, what, what, is the, what is the structure of the uh, substructure of, of the query plan look like? And then you have the actual action you take that defines how you modify the, the, the target in your, in your query plan if you match the pattern, right? So look, look at the example. So my pattern could be something like this. Say I'm doing a, uh, a join across Three, three tables. Well, I'm labeling these as group because I actually don't care what comes below here, right? It could be accessing a table, it could be another join. I just know that I want to deal with two join, equi join operators. So this is the pattern that I'm looking for. So say my query looks like this at this point in, in, in my search. So these boxes represent uh, logical operators because I haven't defined how I'm doing the join, haven't defined what, you know, what, what, what access method I'm using. So my, my query plan here will match this pattern. So if you have a transformation rule, again, this is a logical to logical transformation. I can have a rule that says rotate left to right. So instead of having the, uh, the join for, for two tables on the left side of the tree, I can just rotate it now and have it be on the other side. Yes? Does the group stand for like all logical expressions or all logical and physical expressions? So his question is, what does a group stand for here? It's it's this thing, right? Uh, like, include all the logical and physical. Yeah, correct, yeah. And again, th these things are instantiated as needed, so like, I could just have one, one logical and a bunch of physical, but in, in reality, there could be a ton of these. I just haven't applied the transformation yet. You only do them as, as you need. So again, I don't care at this point what the hell is going on below me. I just know, do I see this pattern and, there, and it matches? All right, so again, I, I can do my, my rotate left to right. 
again, this is logically equivalent to uh, to our original query plan, so that that's fine. Um, and then I can have an implementation rule where I now substitute the uh, I do transformation from logical to physical, so I modify or change out all of the logical join operators now to be physical join operators, where I'm explicitly specifying that I'm doing a sort merge join for uh, you know for these join operators. Yes. Couple of questions. Actually, first, uh, is the rule always cost of living? So can I actually do something to say only if I plan one the cost of roughly like this? So his question is. Is applying a rule cost oblivious? The pattern is called cost oblivious. You could do the transformation, then cost that query, the, the new query plan at that moment, and then decide that it's actually higher than the best query plan you've seen so far. So you you halt the halt the termination. So you always apply the action, or you always apply the rule as far as I know. But after doing the transformation, you could you could then decide I don't want to proceed further. And the second question is. Is there a programmatic way for me to actually derive such equivalence relations from like, the semantics of the, the relational calculus itself as opposed to actually writing these by hand? This question is, is there a way to automatically derive the rules by just taking the grammar of relational calculus? Or, or... Yeah, basically given like, semantics of the relational calculus. So by semantics, you mean what? Like... Well, like... No, because it, it's the optimizations you care about. Relational calculus doesn't define again. Relational calculus is a is a declarative uh -huh. uh, mathematical definition of how to execute a query. It does not say how to execute how to execute it efficiently. So there's nothing in relational calculus that says predicate pushdowns are, are the way to go. Yeah, but I should be able to get a bunch of transformation rules that have, you know only a subset of them will, will work. But then so the you might be able to do this. So you, uh -huh. so you could you. Yeah, that's what I'm I mean, essentially, so you're essentially defining in these rules the, the, the rules of relational algebra, relational calculus, associativity, commutativity, right? That's essentially what, what, what you're defining. You're just, you're, you're defining how to, to, to make the change, though. You seem unsatisfied with that answer. Yeah, I guess, I guess you, can, you can still use a bunch of equivalence rules to, to automatically do transformation rules, they just, on average, won't be helpful. Like, I can, I can basically tell it, you can do associativity, you can do commutativity, then just apply these things over and over again and blow up a lot of things. That's essentially what people do. Right? I mean, your, your statement was, can I, can I automatically derive them? Yeah, because... But, like, like, what does that mean? Like, that's like taking a grammar file or something, a more high level. It's essentially the DSL. Yeah. Well, you, so you can think of the rules. You can think of the rules as a implementation of the transformations that are allowed under relational calculus. All right. Sure. Yes. Yes. All right. So I mentioned this earlier. But what's what's one obvious problem we could have with these logical logical transformations here? So again, we can go from logical to logical, or logical to physical. We can never go physical to logical. MemSQL sort of breaks that, but we'll get there later. What's one obvious problem here? Our transformation is rotate left to right. There's going to be another transformation, rotate right to left. And that puts me back exactly to where I was here, right? Which then would be an infinite loop. What's that? Yeah, so the memoization is going to solve this. So the memo table is going to allow us to store uh, in a compact, I say graph structure, it could be a table, a hash table. Uh, in the original cascade paper, they talk about being a graph. But the idea is that all the, t all the different transformations we've seen before, we can actually maintain a, some information about them to avoid having to, again, just get stuck in an infinite loop by, by changing things back and forth unnecessarily, right? So to make this work, you're going to have to store the, uh, a bunch of information about the, the, the trees you're generating, the query plans you're generating uh, for each group so that you know that if you do a transformation, you would say, aha, I've actually done this before, and I have a cost, so I don't want to do this. Right? So they talk about how to do this efficiently. Um, 
in the 1990s, they, they, they used some hash function called lookup, which I've never heard before. Uh, but the basic idea is, is, again, you have a way to, to hash the, 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 the group you're trying to generate, and you can use the hash code to look up in a hash table and say, I've seen this before or not. Right? So the key thing about the way this is going to, this is going to be able to work is something called the principal op optimality. So now this is not specific to uh, cascades or the top-down search model. It's a high-level concept that is applicable to that's going to allow us to rely on memorization to avoid having to do uh, unnecessary searches with down uh, d different paths. So the basic idea is this: is that every cell plan of an optimal plan is itself optimal, right? It's sort of a uh, no-brainer, but you sort of think about it. If I have a one group at the here and one group here, I, if I know I have the total optimal plan uh, for my entire query, there can't possibly be a more optimal query plan for the, the, the second group at the bottom, because if there was, then I wouldn't be the optimal query plan. Right? So that's basically what the principle optimality uh, says for us. And it basically this allows us to know that once we see that we have a query plan that uh, has a higher cost than the best one we've seen so far, there's no need to even proceed further down into the, the query tree. Right? And we, this is essentially the branch and bound uh, uh, search we can do to cut things off when we know we can't, we're not going to get any better, no matter what we do. All right, so let's look at a high-level example of cascades here. So this is that three-way join between A, B, and C. Um, so what I'm showing here is essentially what you would start with when you initialize your search model on our cascades. Right? So we have our uh, two groups to do the joins, A, B, and C, and A and B. Uh, for now, we'll, we're ignoring you know, joining B and C or joining A, a and C. Right? We'll just deal with joining uh, A, B like this. And then in here, along the leaf nodes, we have the uh, groups that correspond to accessing A, B, and C. And for this, you always have the logical operator, right? get A, get B. I'm not defining, again, physically how I do that. Right? This is pretty much the only logical operator you can have for this. Yes? Is the optimal, is the principle of optimal just for like convenience? Oh, I mean, that's like guarantee that like a uh, query plan of uh, it was just, like every sub query is optimal, is always optimal, like in the final. So your question is, is the principle optimality, is that applicable, sorry, say, say it again. Yeah, so, so like if every sub plan of this optimal, uh, of this plan is optimal, does it mean like it's always true that the optimal, uh, the, the plan as a whole is always optimal. If your subplan is optimal, yeah. So, so, is it so, so it, it, I think question is: if your subplan is optimal, does that mean does that guarantee you the total plan is optimal? Yeah, I mean, is it possible that the total optimal, uh, the total plan is optimal while like one of its like subplans is not optimal? No, it can't be because it wouldn't be the optimal plan, right? If there was a better if there's a better subplan, then that would be the optimal plan, not the one you have. It'll make more sense for the access methods. Yes? So you should, so you should like, it's always dirty. Okay. Well, that's the reverse. That, that, that tells you suboptimal plans will always come back to the optimal plan. If that were true, this wouldn't be a PR. Yes. Um, is that suboptimal plan optimal in like, the context of the overall plan? Because what about cases where, like, suppose you need to sort your output? Like you might want to choose a sorting join, which would like pr like produce a better cost, but like that sort join may not be the best plan for that. Yeah. Just like yeah, that was really itself. Uh, now I get I get your point. Um, I guess that actually depends on how you define your tree. Yeah. Whether it's sorted or not is included in the tree structure, then you will get a different tree, and that would be fine. Yes, so I, think, so I think he's correct, yes. Yeah, we'll come back to this. All right. Um, for simplicity, I, I didn't include any physical uh, properties in here, but uh, we can talk about it afterwards. All right, so again, so what I'm showing here is what you see when you first initialize a search with cascades, right? You always have to have the root. Again, this is the output we want. We want to join A, join B, join C. And then 
I'm only showing one of the uh, groups that can be extracted out of this. Uh, we'll see later on that you would expand this out, but you have to start somewhere, so this would be the, sort of the first thing you, that you would pick. So at the very beginning, uh, what we're going to do is pick one logical expression uh, to, 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 to generate from our expected output here. So this is, again, this is what we knew what was going to come. This is A join B uh, together in some way. We, we haven't defined it yet at this point in our multi-expression. And then we're going to have uh, an access on C. So we would traverse down now into the tree, and we land at this group. And again, we haven't defined any logical expressions yet, so we, we would generate the first one, uh, A join B. And again, this is a logical expression, so I'm not defining how the joins performed, and I'm also not defining how the, the I'm accessing A and B, right? Because that wouldn't, wouldn't be defined here, it had to be defined down below. So let's say now I, I traverse down, go to this, this, this next group here, and I already have my uh, logical expression get A, so I can transform that now to do either the physical uh, multi-expression to do a file scan on A, essentially a sequential scan, or an index scan. I'm ignoring you know, how you define what index it is, but assume that for every, every possible index you could have, you would have one physical expression for that. And then you can do obvious pruning to say, like, if the query doesn't access this, uh, you know, these attributes that are defined my index, then I wouldn't want to include that anyway. So let's say that uh, I evaluate both of these, and I run through my cost model and say, which one of these is actually the best? So for, to, to make this work in the, in the cost model, you actually have to send along um, more information about the context of the query plan. But for all these other things, we don't have a physical plan yet. So it's sort of based exactly on just what's going to cost to actually execute this, this one, one file scan. So say that this one is the best. This has cost 10, again, which is an internal metric that means nothing to the outside world. But for our purposes, we just say it's 10. And then in our memorization table, we'll record that for the group with the output of A, the file scan, what had the lowest cost. And we have, again, record information on how we got there, uh, what was our logical transformation to get there, and then what the cost was as well. So then we go back up now to the next group and do the same thing, go down to the next one. We, we, again, we apply our transformation rule from the logical expression to the physical expression. And then for our purposes, we, again, we say that the, the file scan is, has the lowest cost. And we update our memo table. All right, so now at this point, though, uh, we can make a decision about uh, what the next transformation is that it is that we want to do. So we could do uh, from a logical to physical, and now try to figure out what the join algorithm we want to use. Or we could do a lo another logical to logical to now try another combination of the, uh, of, of the join ordering. Good? OK. Um, so for our purposes, again, this, this is what these priorities we can define. For this example here, we'll just say, well, let's do a logical to logical transformation. Um, and now you see where the memorization table will help, because when I want to say, what's the cost of actually accessing B or A, and these arrows should be switched. Um, I've already computed these costs, right? This is the optimal selection for, for, for this part of the tree here. So I don't actually need to go to the cost model and say, and, or do any of these transformations to say, what's the cost of accessing these things? I know I have it in my memo table, and I can just reuse that. Yes? Are the costs predefined? Your question is, is the cost predefined? Yes. Uh, what do you mean by predefined? How do they compute the cost? You see, there's a thing called the cost model. Okay. You, you give it a query plan, and it says, uh, I expect you to execute you know, with cost x. And what x actually means is internal to the system. It, we'll see this next class. It, you, you know, it's often the cardinality of the operator. How much data you're reading, how much data you're going to output. So it looks like if you want the memorization work, the cost model has to know that these so the statement is, for this example here, the cost model needs to know that the, that, what do you mean from the, sorry, say what so do you like mean? If I, if, if the cost model is a completely separate component, I tell it to do A join B, it gives me a number. Yes. And then I ask it to do B join A, it doesn't necessarily know to reuse the previous cost estimate. Oh yeah, so, so the cost model is dumb, doesn't know anything. All this memorization table is that's stored in the optimizer. 
So the optimizer has to know how to apply join to, to combine two cost model results into a new cost, right? Um, this part is actually not clear to me. Uh, it seems as if you just want to be able to take the whole thing and compute the cost. Uh, but the problem is you haven't defined how the hell you're actually doing these other things. So you could set these to be infinity because you don't know, and that's, that's, a, that's your upper bound. But that doesn't help you because now you're not being able to compute, you know, do any pruning until you get the very top. Um, from what I can tell, in this case in Columbia, yes, they, they do a summation and add these things together. And for things where they don't have a physical plan, uh, they rely on a, 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 a gross approximation based on uh, cardinality. But that, to me, that seems kind of hacky, and it seems like again you're 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 bleeding logic from the cost model now into the to the optimizer. I don't. I actually don't know. What we don't, I don't know what we do. Well, we, we can ask Boe. Okay. All right. So uh, now we can. Uh, you know, there's only possible two logical transformations for this output: a join b, b join a. So. Now we've exhausted all the transparent transformations we can do, so we can apply all the physical ones, right? And for our purposes, they're saying we just we generate all of them. So we can do uh, a join b with a, a nested loop, a join b with a sort merge, and I guess I'm missing four, but you could have a, b join a with a nested loop as well. And again, we do the same thing. We could we could uh, use the cost model to estimate what the cost is for each of these, and then we can take the summation of the, the cost generated by our children groups and add that together to the cost of what would be to compute this. And then we update our memorization table to say that doing the sort merge on A and B uh, is, the, is, the best, is the most optimal plan so far for, for this group. We go back up now to the tree. Now we go down, go down the other side and do the same thing on, on C. And now we have another cost. So. At this point now, um, again, we have that same choice where we can apply additional more logical transformations to expand out now the root of the tree, um, or we can do physical transformations and expand those things out. Right? This really ends, ends up depending on what you know, the priority for these transformations. But then what will happen is, because now we have different join orderings for, uh, and for our, our, our root group, this will create a bunch of new groups that again have all the same information about how to do transformations for the data that it has as well in here. So this is clear at a high level, right? In the system R case, you start at the bottom, you have nothing, all right? None of your tables are sorted. So you, so you start with the access methods or the individual tables. Then you go up and say, how do I join two tables together? And then you go up even further, how to join three tables together, right? Where this is sort of starting logically at the top and you, and you go down. So what's one, one big question we have about this? Right, I'm at, I'm, at, I'm at a terminal, I write my query, I hit enter. I don't want it to take minutes, right? If I have a lot of tables, this could be an exhaustive search. So we need a way to know when we should we stop. So uh, this is called search term, determination, termination. So essentially, what, how do we figure out when is actually the right time for us to halt the search? And whatever the best plan we've seen so far, we say that, that's what we're going to go use. It may not be the optimal plan, but again, we knew that going into this because we knew we weren't going to do a, an exhaustive search. So the most obvious thing is just to use wall clock time, and this is what pretty much everyone uses. You essentially need to stop the optimizer. If, it, if you know you've exhaustively searched everything, um, or you stop right away. Otherwise, when you hit this timer, you just stop and spit out whatever the best query plan is. Um, a, you can also define a cost threshold. Um, it, basically, you say, if I have some, uh, some current uh, cost that I, want, I know I want to try to compare against, and if I'm 10% better than that, then that's good enough. I'll just stop right there. So this is not something you typically do in a real system because Again, the cost model is spitting out these internal values that don't have any real meaning to the outside world. So this can be used for things like prepared statements, where you say, I have my, my query plan that I generated an hour ago for this prepared statement. Let me just run op opportunistically the, the, the cost model, or the, the optimizer. And if I find a plan that's 10% better, uh, then I'll stop right away. Otherwise, I'll terminate after, after you know, 1,000 milliseconds or something. 
And then, and then the last one, as I said before, is like when you know there's no more transformation you, you can do on your plan, you just stop right there, right? And this is typically done on uh, the per group level. So if, if you know you've terminated or exhausted all groups, you, you can stop entirely. So now, as I said before, that uh, Cascades model came out of this movement called the optimizer generators in the late 1980s, early 1990s. Um, and so it's been implemented in a, a, a couple of different uh, toolkits from back then. I already mentioned Wisconsin Up++, and then the, uh, at a Portland State University, um, they had this thing called Columbia, which again, I think is the best, uh, not the best open source implementation, but it's the best description of how this thing actually works. Um, but since then, the Cascades model has shown up in other, uh, other uh, modern toolkits. So Pivotal Oracle, or it's Orca, is a uh, Cascades implementation written in C++ that runs as a standalone service. And we'll talk about it in a second, but basically Pivotal designed this to be the, the query optimizer for all their sort of big data systems. So they had this thing called Greenplum, which is a distributed uh, parallel version of Postgres. Sort of came out at the same time Vertica did. Um, and they had this other thing called uh, Hawk, which is like SQL on top of Hadoop. But rather than writing query optimizers for each system, you could run Orca as a, as a standalone service, send queries over XML, and it, knew, it had all the transformation rules to do you know, query optimization, and it would spit you back a, um, an optimized query plan. We looked into this when we first started building our system. We abandoned it because way too much XML, and it was, it was not really clear. There was no documentation when we looked at it before, but I think they, they since fixed it up, but we've already moved on. And then in the Apache uh, Foundation, they have something called Calcite, is written in Java, and this is designed to be a Java-based implementation of Cascades. I don't know how good it is versus Orca versus what our thing could do. Um, I've heard good things, I've heard bad things, um, but we haven't looked into this. In terms of Cascades implementations that actually integrated in systems, SQL Server is probably the most famous one of this. The SQL Server's query optimizer is really, really good. The cost model is really, really good. We'll see this in the paper you guys need read for next week. Actually, what, today's Monday, right? What is today? <laughs> On Wednesday. Uh, I woke up at 3 a.m. I couldn't fall asleep. All right. Uh, in the paper you guys read from Wednesday, their query optimizer is, is the best. And they do, a, they do a benchmark on a bunch of different ones. This one produces the best plans. I'm not saying because it's Cascades. I think they also do awesome, have an awesome cost model and, and statistics and sampling. Um, but this is probably the best implementation of Cascades that's most well known. Tandem Not and Stop SQL was a company, a database company that got bought by uh, HP. It's still around, but uh, I have to bleep this, but... <laughs> people still pay for this, uh, but it's not really being updated anymore. Clusterix has a small little blip on their documentation to say they have a... Uh, a uh, that they have a query optimizer called Sierra that's based on Cascades. And then in our system in Peloton, we've been spending the last year and a half to actually trying to build out our own ca Cascades implementation. Um, the Op++ one is interesting because, I guess, as I said, it's meant to do both top-down or sort of bottom-up and top-down search all in a single framework. And you can decide as the database system implementer which one you want to use. All right. So kind of going through real quickly, um, predicate expressions are a big deal that we have to deal with. Um, in the case of Cascades, uh, we can represent them just as more operators, right? And so then the, the transformations that we can do uh, for you know, you know, things like joins are, are essentially applied the same way for, uh, for predicate expressions. And we can rely on the fact that we know the rules of, of you know, Boolean logic or, or logic in general to make sure that we generate uh, predicates or apply predicates in a way that that's produces still the correct result. So the most common optimization you want to do is predicate pushdown. Um, and in the case of Cascades, there's essentially three ways to do this. So the first way is to just embed it as a rule or transformation in, in, the, in the search model that's applied like anything else. Um, and the advantage of this is that you can use your cost model again to help you decide whether a pushing down a predicate a certain way will actually produce a, a better result for you. Um, the alternative is actually to do either uh, perform the pushdown either before or after you generate the optimal plan during the regular uh, uh, cascade search process. So this is sort of what Postgres does, right? They do a read-write phase 
where before you start converting things from logical, logical operators to physical operators, you do the push down in here. Um, the literature says that this actually makes it tricky to do complex predicates, but Postgres is really good, so I don't know whether that's true. And then the alternative, which is actually a bad idea, but for, for, for completeness, we can talk about it, is that you do all your query optimization that, that you would do normally, ignoring how to do predicate pushdown, and then once you generate a optimal plan in quotes, uh, then you do your, 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 your predicate pushdown. The reason why this is a terrible idea is because if all of your scans now are just doing complete sequential scans because you haven't pushed down the predicates, then the cost, the selectivity estimation for every single uh, uh, you know, lookup on a table will be one. So therefore, you'll never actually, you'll probably generate the worst possible plan. Um, so nobody does this. I probably should just remove it. Uh, don't do that. But another interesting thing we got to deal with is uh, what's the right order for applying predicates? So in most of the literature, you know, you see the where clause, and the where clause will say, you know, a equals one and b equals two, and you just assume, all right, well, I'll just do a equals one, and then I'll do b equals two. But it may may be the case that not only will have predicates have different selectivities, they'll actually also have different costs to actually apply them. So. The standard way everyone always does this is just you pick the selectivity how to reorder things. But there may be the case where some predicates are super expensive to evaluate, so maybe you don't want to actually uh, apply them at the bottom of, of your query plan, and you may want to migrate them, move them up to, to a higher part. So an example here, right? I save, I have my single select star from foo, where foo.id equals one, two, three, four, and then I compute the SHA-512 hash on a some kind of string and see whether that matches the thing that I'm looking for. So it may be the case that this thing is uh, is has reasonable selectivity, but computing the you know 512 bit hash on the value is really expensive. So maybe I want to do that uh, much later, you know, when, when I'm producing the final output. Or if I had a join, maybe I want to do this after I did the join. All right? Yes. Maybe this isn't exactly. Question, but like, is it possible that sometimes the solution in this case is just to make a column that is like that kind of get evaluated? So his question is, uh, it's not a query. It's, it's a physical design question. So his question is, and in my example here, I'm computing this on the fly. Say I was executing this query all the time. Does it make sense to pre-compute the SHA-512 for this column? Store that internally, and then now when my when I do my my actually my query instead of computing this on the fly, I had the thing pre-computed for me. That's essentially called a materialized view. All right. Uh, actually, you can also do it as an index. You can build an index with functions that essentially act like a materialized view. Um, so this is a physical design question that the database most database systems do not do for you. Uh, the administrator has to do this. We're trying to do this automatically, and this is actually one of the things we want to build in the self-driving system. Right? There was work done by Microsoft in the or 2000s, late 1990s, where they can suggest materialized views to solve exactly this problem here. Yes? Why would you, why would you be able to estimate the selectivity for SHA-512 at all? So his question is, how could you even estimate the selectivity of this? Because, because this is a black box. By definition, it shouldn't be able to. Correct. So this is actually one of the big problems with functions, and especially user-defined functions, is that from the optimizer standpoint, or the cost model standpoint, this is a black box. I have no idea what the selectivity is. Now, you can be a little bit clever and say, like, well, I'll, I'll watch what happens a couple of times, and then I compute the selectivity based on that. Um, Microsoft has a paper where they can convert uh, UDFs into actual relational algebra and just throw that in, in the query plan itself and then run that through the regular cost model. Uh, that came out in VODB, like, two months ago. Uh, that's actually super cool. Um, no other system can actually handle this. UDFs are always treated like black boxes, and the, you, you just take a worst case estimate. Yeah, uh, it just confused me that wouldn't, they, wouldn't the whole credit case be like, predetermined to be false when you really have the first question, like a full ID? If, if the two post full ID is not equal to one before, then you jump out and you're not careful the same. Uh, so, yeah, so that should be or. Yeah, so he's absolutely right. So it wouldn't be the case if you evaluate, well, no, not necessarily, right? This doesn't have to be a primary key, right? I could have a billion tuples that match one, two, three, four, 
but then half of them match, match this. So the first filter could let everything through, or let some subset through, and then I do further refining with this. If it was a primary key, sure, you, as soon as you match, right, you're done. And therefore, you're only bad at one tool. But in this case here, assume it's not unique. All right, uh, let's talk a little about uh, Orca for a bit. As I said, it is a standalone Cascades implementation. And the way it works is that you run it on a separate machine, and you invoke their API to send over catalog information, stats, and then the logical plans. And then they already have uh, the transformation rules written for you to do the um, you know, to, to do query optimization in the search in a Cascades model. What's really interesting about it is that uh, they actually support multi-threaded search. So up until you know, in my example, I just showed well, yeah, here's what a single thread will do when it does search. In most database systems, uh, search is always single-threaded, right? Because you know, you you kind of want to have the your your threads executing queries, not crunching on the query the query model, uh, the, the query search. But in the case of Orca, again, it's designed to run on a standalone machine, so you can blast it with all the cores, and it's not going to not going to slow down your 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 system. And of course, now you got to deal with the issue of make sure you send your catalog and stats all the time to keep them fresh and make sure you get correct estima estimations. Um, but this is certainly an interesting approach. And there has been some work in, on, in, in academia on using GPUs to do query search. But as far as you know, that hasn't made it into to any, any real system. What I like about Orca, though, is especially in this paper, is they talk about how to build a real query optimizer in, you know, for the real world. Um, and so there's two issues that they had to deal with, and they talk about how to actually solve them. So the first is that uh, they wanted to be able to do debugging uh, for things that crash remotely, right? And so normally what happens is that when you run your, you know, you run your program and you hit a seg fault or some problem, it'll core dump, right? And you'll see the stack, um, and you'll see what's in your heap, but you're not going to see all the information about the path you took to get to, uh, you know, to, to that particular problem that you were hit. So what they would do is they would have the ability to basically maintain the trace history of how you're searching in, in the tree so that when you crash, you get all this extra state information dumped out that you can then send back to their offices and then help them try to reproduce the exact error that you were hitting. Um, now, the cloud guys don't really have this issue because if the, you know, if the system crashes running on, on your cloud setup, you just look right inside of it and see what's going on. Right? The other issue is that they wanted to make sure that their, their optimizer was actually generating accurate uh, um, query plans in terms, of, uh, in terms of the cost model. So a big issue is if, you're, if, you're, if you, your query optimizer generates two query plans, one that thinks it's the optimal one and one thinks it's, it'll be slower, you want to know when you actually run them that the one that I thought was faster is, actually is truly faster. Right? The cost model doesn't need to be accurate in terms of like that, that one is 20 times faster than the other. You just want to know that if, if, if the cost model thinks this one's better than this one, it actually should have, be, look that way when you actually run it. So they have a, uh, a toolkit, a testing framework, I forget what the name is, but it's, uh, it's actually not open source, I haven't been able to find it. But they have a whole way to sort of set this up as like a fuzz tester to try out different query plans, run them, and see that uh, the, the, the relative order of how they actually match up in the cost model matches up their real order when they run them. So to, to finish up real quickly with uh, MemSQL, again, the, the reason why I had you guys read this paper is because um, it's interesting to see they describe things differently than how we, in the Columbia paper or, or the Cascades paper, but at a high level, they're sort of more or less doing the same thing. So it's not a Cascades implementation, um, but it has bits and pieces from, from everything. So they have basically three components. They have a rewriter, a numerator, and a planner. So the rewriter is doing logical to logical transformations, but they can actually access the cost, mo cost model in the way that the heuristic stuff couldn't do to actually see whether they're actually doing proper transformations. And then for the enumerator, it's mostly focused on join ordering, but this is where they were doing logical to physical transformations. And then the planner would actually take the physical plans generated by the enumerator and then convert them back to SQL and then send them to other execution nodes. 
So again, this class is all about single node systems. This paper is about them being uh, a distributed query executor or distributed query uh, planning. Um, they make a big deal about how their thing is, is keeps track of the distribution in a way that other systems don't, which I th they are correct. That's the right way to do it. Um, but I didn't really feel like that was the major contribution. This last piece is actually the most interesting because as far as I know, nobody actually does this. Everyone else would, if you have a distributed database system, they ship around around the physical plan, right? Because that, and everyone knows how to execute those. But they actually ship around SQL. So sort of what happens is if you have your, your, your SQL generated on one, one node, then you ship that to another node. They basically have to do this all over again, right? To put it back into a physical plan that they can actually execute. But what's interesting about this is that because they're, you're doing the planning at the local node, you're actually going to, for the, for the sort of sub plans you generate here, you actually generate an optimal plan based on what you know about the data locally. Whereas the, in, a, in a global system, the stats may not be up to date. And the, wherever, the, wherever node did the planning may actually generate an uh, unoptimal plan because the data has changed since, the, since you got the last stats update. So again, at a high level, this sort of looks like this. Uh, you have a parser. It's like everyone else, you have abstract syntax tree, you bind the object IDs to, the, to what's in the catalog, then you feed it to the rewriter. I don't know whether this is actually true, whether you can go back from the enumerator to rewriter, but essentially this does all the logical transformations, this does logical physical transformations, they need to take the output of the physical plan and run it through what they call the planner, but this just emits SQL, right? The Confusing thing about the paper is they talk about how the rewriter can do SQL to SQL transformation or SQL to SQL rewriting, but then other parts of the paper they say it's doing logical to logical transformations. So I think they're doing this. I don't think anybody would do would modify SQL to SQL. Um, all right, I just want to finish up real quickly. All right, so the as I said before, this is the quote from from David Dewitt. Uh, it, it may not be attributed to him, but it is in his slides that he gave at Microsoft a, a few years ago. But he says, query optimization is not rocket science. When you flunk out of query optimization, we make you go build rockets, <laughs> right? Because again, it's just, I've covered it in two, two lectures. People have spent decades looking into this. Um, again, and the research literature originally suggested that there was actually no difference in the type of quality of the, of the plans you can generate using the bottom up versus top down search strategies. And this actually comes from the op plus plus paper that Dave DeWitt wrote in the 1990s. Um, and as we'll see next week, none of this actually is, matters at all if your cost model is generating crappy estimations. In order to have good estimations, you need statistics and other things, sampling to get, make this actually work. Any questions? Yes? What are the differences between like, standard own implementation and the So this question is, what's the difference, what are the trade-offs for the standalone implementations versus the integrated implementations? Well, I mean, there is a latency issue, right? Because you have to go send the request to the standalone thing. Uh, on the other hand, you don't have to build one because you can just use theirs. Uh, I mean, there's pros and cons of these things. The, I say the major issue is not having direct access to the data or the database and knowing, you know, having you know, perfectly up-to-date stats for these things. But you have this problem in distributed databases as well. <clears throat> right, think of this, think of for OLAP, right? My query is going to run for an hour. Do I care if it takes a few milliseconds to send over the request to do planning on another machine and then get the response back? Probably not. All right, so I say here as I, as I, that there, the research suggests that there is no difference between the quality between the bottom up versus, versus the, the top down search strategies. So Gertz Graphy was awarded a, uh, I think the test of time or system innovator for uh, award at Sigmod last year. And he gave a talk basically was you know, in a one-hour crash course of all the things, various things we've talked about that he's worked on uh, throughout his entire career. And at the very end, he started talking about Cascades, and he mentioned, oh, you know, it's in Orca, it's in Calcite, it's in CMU system. But then he sort of made this offhanded comment at the very end, just like, oh, well, actually, maybe Cascades isn't the best. Uh, and this was captured by Joe Hellerstein, who is a uh, database professor at uh, Berkeley. And he says, surprising comments from Graphy on query optimization. And he says, use dynamic programming for joins, the, the bottom-up approach, um, and use cascades for extensibility operators, so being able to support um, you know, all sorts of possible different uh, complex queries. And then he expanded to say that there's a paper from Thomas Neumann, the hyper guy, showing you that the, doing the dynamic programming approach is more efficient than cascades for join enumeration. So 
Uh, the guide event of Cascades maybe says the Cascades isn't the right way to go. Uh, at this point, we're going with Cascades. What can I say, right? OK. At some point, I should talk to him about what, what he said. All right, extra credit, real quick. So the extra credit assignment, uh, I think it's 10%, is that you can write a, an encyclopedia article about your favorite database management system. Right? Uh, we're actually building a new website, um, like very, very close, as in like a day or two from actually putting it up. We had to outsource it. I'll explain later. Uh, but the basic idea is that we're trying to build the database of databases. So you want to write a Wikipedia-style article about a database system, but rather than being free-form text like it is in Wikipedia, you actually there's actually a taxonomy defined with pre-selected options for you for the different components of the system. So if you ever go, ever go, go to Wikipedia and you read like the, the, the article on Postgres and the article on MySQL, right, sometimes they refer to you know, MVCC in different ways. Right? Whereas there is, you know, there, there is a standard way to define what MVCC actually is. So the idea is that for all these different features of the system, you select these predefined options, and then you write a little paragraph and say, here's, here's, why it, here's how, how it's actually implemented. Right? And then you provide citations. So the website sort of looks like this. So this is an example of what Greenpalm looks like. And again, there's different subsections to say, here's what the commercial model looks like, here's how to do checkpoints, here's how to do data models. Right? So essentially all the things we're talking about in this, in this class. And then it's hard to see in this, but like, then you have, again, a, a form you can edit things. Um, and then this is going to allow us to do, again, it's butchered, but my holy grail is to then be able to do a search in the encyclopedia and say, show me all the data systems that do MVCC. Show me all the data systems that do two-phase locking with deadlock prevention. Right? By having this taxonomy and that, that semi-structured, we allows us to do this search. So the website is dbdb.io. Uh, <laughs> it's the database of databases. I thought about using db2.io, but that's asking for a lawsuit. Um, so I, what I'll do is I'll, I'll put a sign-up sheet on, the, on the, the Google spreadsheet. Go pick whatever system you, you want to write about. Some systems have already been written out in the past from previous years, and so I'll show which ones you can't use. And so first come, first serve. So what I'll say is if you pick an, a widely known one, like if you pick Oracle, for example, there's a ton of information about Oracle. So therefore, I expect you to have a you know, comprehensive and, and well-written and well-cited article. Um, if, you, if you choose something more obscure, pumpkin DB, right, what, hamster DB, whatever, right, uh, then there may not be a lot of documentation. And I, maybe I can help you find something, or we can get in touch with the, with the developers and help you fill in uh, what's, what's missing. So I've shown this. Uh, I've shown this list before. Uh, so I have a spreadsheet of all possible data systems I know about. It's around like 500 or so. Uh, it's a combination of academic and commercial ones uh, and open source ones. So there should be enough for everyone to pick. Okay? Subway? Yes, it's a database. Okay. <laughs> so again, I've, I've warned you guys before. Please don't steal whatever's there. Right? Uh, it, it's you know if if you make sure everything's cited. Write everything in your own words. Don't just just don't take you know cut and paste from the the you know their documentation and put it into the website. Okay. Again, I'll I'll post the the website uh, uh, later today, and then and the sign up sheet. Okay. All right. So next class, cost models, and then I'll spend a little time talking again about some general tips about how working in a large code base. All right. So I need back everyone's final exam and the ten practice or ten solutions. Just go. Yeah. Mmm, I need something refreshing when I get finished manifesting. Too cold, a whole bowl like Smith and Wesson. One court, and my thoughts hip hop related. Write a rhyme, and my pen's intoxicated. Lyrics are quicker with a sip of more liquor. Since I'm a city slicker, brain waves are quicker. Rhymes I create rotate at a way too quick to duplicate. Fill a breeze as I skate. Mics at Fahrenheit when I hold it real tight. When I'm in flight, then we ignite. Blood starts to boil. I heat up the party for you. Let my girl rub me and my mic down with oil Red still turns with third degree burn for one man I heat up your brain, give it a suntan So just cool, let the temperature rise To cool it off with St. Ives